Okay, great. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Kay Halisak, director of the Michael V. Drake Institute for Teaching and Learning. I'm also a professor in the English department here at Ohio State. Um, and I briefly wanted to introduce my colleagues who are here with me today and facilitating and supporting this uh, session. Laura Cotton is our program coordinator in the Drake Institute. Laura, if you can give a quick wave so folks can see you. There she is in the north, in the short north there in Columbus. In Columbus. Um, Dr. Melinda Rhodes DeSalvo, who's one of our associate directors in the Drake Institute, previously from the OSU College of Vet Med Teaching and Learning Center, and then Dr. Helen Malone from the Office of Academic Affairs. Um, Melinda and Helen will be joining me a little bit later and facilitating a couple of the breakout sessions, and Laura will be providing uh, technical support. We will be using the chat uh, box fairly uh, actively in this session, and we also encourage you to use the chat session, the chat box for questions that you have. We'll be monitoring that, and um, as much as we can and keep on schedule, we'll be answering the questions that maybe are very quickly answered. Melinda, Helen, and Laura will be monitoring and answering um, questions that can be answered very quickly. Laura may also be able to search from resource, some resources to help for other particular questions that you may have. If we don't answer immediately, um, just hang tight. We're gonna be looking at those during, our, uh, during the time when we're asking you all to take a short writing session. And we do have time at the end of our session today to actually um, answer some of those questions as well. I'm now going to begin sharing my screen and turn to my PowerPoint presentation. I'm going to minimize here as well. I will not be able to see the chat, uh, so I'll be depending on Laura and Melinda and Helen to alert me to any, um, any chats that come uh, forward that you all uh, might like me to answer most immediately. Again, here's our welcome to you. Uh, welcome again to the Strike Institute and OAA sponsored workshop on documenting teaching. This is a collaborative effort between the Office of Academic Affairs and the Drake Institute. Uh, and uh, we're just delighted that the three dozen or more of you who are here um, are here uh, to learn more about the documenting teaching through the PNT process at Ohio State. I wanna begin by acknowledging that the lands that are occupied by Ohio State are ancestral and contemporary territory of the Shawnee, Potawatomi, Delaware, Miami, Peoria, Seneca, Wyandotte, Ojibwe and Cherokee peoples. The university resides on land ceded in the 1795 Treaty of Greenville and the forced removal of tribes through the Indian Removal Act of 1830. Uh, like many of you, I've lived my entire life in states that includes, include lands taken from forcibly and often by deception from indigenous nations. I honor the resiliency of these tribal nations and recognize the historical contexts that have and continue to affect the indigenous peoples of this land. I also want to uh, briefly note that in addition um, to making this uh, land acknowledgement statement, in the interest of accessibility, I will be reading most of the content of the slides for anyone who might be attending who has uh, difficulty reading um, from reading the slides themselves. This workshop is intended for early career and pre-tenured faculty. The session introduces best practices in documenting teaching writing teaching statements and early considerations for reappointment, promotion and tenure. Uh, this slide also includes the names of the facilitators and those are myself, Melinda Rhodes DeSalvo and Helen Malone, whom I introduced just a few minutes ago. We have four specific distinct objectives for today's session. We hope that by the time we finished our two hours that you will be able to describe the various elements of documenting teaching for the OSU dossier in particular, that you will also be able to describe the key elements of a strong teaching statement, apply those same elements in composing research and service statements that are also part of the OSU PNT dossier, and finally to identify and draw upon the additional resources that support the development of teaching, research, and service statements here at Ohio State. Um, our agenda today, um, it falls across six different um, sort of areas uh, of focus uh, from two o'clock to 2.10, welcome and introduction, which is where we are right now, uh, between 2.10 and 2.40. I'll be talking about documenting teaching and composing effective teaching statements. Um, again, the PowerPoint slide I think was pre uh, pr uh, 
made available to you before the session, so you can certainly follow um, along in your own uh, computer as well. Between 2.40 and 3.10, we'll have a guided writing session. That's a session where we're going to ask you to go away, to mute your microphones, um, mute your videos, and write um, using one of the prompt sets of prompts that we'll make available for you today. Then from 3.10 to 3.20, we'll reconvene and introduce the breakout sessions that will be available for you uh, between 3.20 and 3.40. Finally, we'll all reconvene at 3.40, and for the final 20 minutes, we'll have a wrap up and talk about the next steps that we encourage you to take um, as you continue to work on and compose your teaching, research, and service statements for PNT. Um, I do want to, um, as just as a final word here, um, as I'm at the intro part of things, um, to just ask you to, as I think you all have, um, mute your microphones um, it, unless you're speaking. Please feel free to mute your video as well. Um, we're perfectly fine if you'd like to mute the video. Um, and then also, as I said, use the chat. The other function that is available for you is the, if you have a newer version of Zoom, is the, um, the closed caption. So there is a live transcript that is available that you can activate um, on your screen should you wish to turn the sound down or if you uh, need to or prefer to view the transcript live, that's available. That transcript will also be available on the recorded session, which you will all be uh, receiving. So you will also be able to have those activated closed captionings um, available on the recording of this session. As you all know, the dossier that you're going to be preparing for promotion and tenure asks you to articulate and document your work and the evidence of your um, achievements in teaching, research, and service. Certainly, these are all three distinct parts of our work as faculty at the university. At the same time, there is often overlap. There is often that space within which our teaching and research, research and service, teaching and service are all three of those come together. And so for many of us, that middle circle may be very uh, large. It may encompass more and more elements of all three areas of our work. And for others of us, it may be a slightly smaller overlap across teaching, research, and service. It's important to know that the dossier asks you that, uh, um, and the processes of PNT at Ohio State ask you and give you the space to narrate your beliefs, your achievements, and your future plans for teaching, research, and service. So we wanna keep this Venn diagram um, in mind as you think about not just whether or how these three areas overlap, but how the teaching, research, and service statements that you make will uh, rely on and reflect back on one another during the process of composing uh, those narratives for, for your dossier. So keep this Venn diagram in mind. I will be focusing primarily today on the teaching statement, but we do encourage you to ask questions um, and then also speak with Helen, Melinda and me during the breakout sessions um, about the three different statements that you'll be working on over the next few years, my guess is. I'm gonna be focusing as said on, docu uh, on documenting teaching. Now in advance of this session, you should also have received a Word document that lists all of the elements of the dossier relative to teaching, research and service. Here on this slide, I have just extracted the 10 items that are included as part of documenting teaching. So when Helen or I or Melinda talk about documenting teaching, we're talking about all 10 of these distinct elements in your dossier. Within those 10 documents, you'll see our items six, seven, and nine. And those are the three narratives. The sixth item is your 750 word description of and approach to goals for teaching, as well as a 250 word statement on the evaluation of teaching. You also have a brief description um, of the other academic advising that you do. Now, again, these three are related to teaching, my apologies. And then there are two more on research and service. Um, these 10 items list um, are your courses taught. That basic information will be pulled from the student information system. So you do not need to keep a list of the courses that you've been teaching. They'll be automatically generated through SIS and made available to you. You also list your involvement in exams, theses, dissertations, and undergraduate research. That's item two. Item three, any involvement with postdoctoral scholars. 
four, extension and continuing education instruction, five is curriculum development, six and seven are those statements on teaching and the evaluation of teaching, eight are formal award, is formal awards and recognition for teaching, nine is the brief, a brief description of other academic advising, 10 is completion of teaching development programs like those that we have available through the Drake Institute. I also want to um, just briefly, um, as an aside, say, start keeping track now. <laughs> start keeping um, a Word document, ideally the Word document that is actually this dossier outline so that you can have it available to you. Um, I would encourage that you maybe even set an Outlook reminder to yourself every week, every two weeks, every month to step in and keep these inf pieces of information updated. Believe me, if you wait until your annual review or um, until an annual activity report is due as it is in my department probably later this month, you'll be going back to a calendar trying to remember everything and you will miss things. And the point of the dossier and the point of this documentation for teaching research and service is to make sure that you have a comprehensive listing of all of the contributions that you've made to those areas while you, while you are at Ohio State. You are responsible for this. No one else can, um, uh, can make that information available. So please create a, a system of reminders for yourself to keep track. And then also um, a single space where you do keep this information. Just as a word, we know box is going away. I would encourage you if you're not, if you don't yet know Office 365 or don't use OneDrive that you begin doing that now um, and perhaps use uh, Teams. I've created my own team site for myself and that's where I keep all of this information. Um, I'd also encourage you to ask your PNT chair or other colleagues in your department who've been recently promoted and tenured to get their best advice about how they manage this, uh, this workload, because this is work, um, but a consistent systematic approach now will save time in the future. So again, there are um, OAA required dossier statements and this slide lists this one, two, three, four, five, six different statements that you will and narratives that you will include a 750 word teaching statement describing those approaches to and goals in teaching, your major accomplishments and your plans for the future in teaching. A separate 250 word evaluation statement describing how you have used evaluation information to improve the quality of instruction. Now that evaluation information could be peer um, observations of your teaching, it could be SEI scores or other student uh, discursive um, or evaluation uh, measurements or tools that you might use. You'll all, you're also prompted to give a brief description of student advising that you have completed. Um, I want to just pause for a moment here too to say when we talk about teaching and advising, we're, we're also talking about mentoring. So as you think about how you are working in advising students, broaden that understanding both of teaching and advising to include mentoring students at the undergraduate, graduate, and postdoctoral level. You also have a 750 word research statement, which describes the focus of your research, your scholarly or creative work. Again, major accomplishments as you have in teaching and plans for the future. So there are common elements here across the teaching and research statements that ask you to identify it and describe major accomplishments as well as your plans for the future. Um, also note that the research statement includes works in progress. Finally, in the service uh, area of your dossier, that third part of the Venn diagram, you'll provide a summary of participation in student life programs here at Ohio State and a brief elaboration, which Helen uh, told me just the other day actually can be as many as 750 words. So a 750 word elaboration on and additional information about service activities that are listed in your dossier. These are the narrative statements. And again, as I talk today about and give you uh, recommendations and evidence-based practices for producing effective teaching statements, keep in mind that many of those approaches and strategies can be used uh, as you produce your research and service statements. Um, but again, the folks today will be on the teaching statements themselves. 
On this slide, I have a definition of teaching statements um, brought, uh, that's uh, taken from Schreiner um, at the University of Oregon, their teaching engagement program. A teaching statement is a narrative description, a description of one's conception of teaching, including the rationale for one's teaching methods. And that description comes from Beatty, Lay, and Dean, uh, 2009. Um, the teaching statement expresses the processes of reflection on teaching and learning. For example, one's self-awareness as a teacher and one's awareness of students and their learning. And so for that reason, in some ways, I would encourage you to think about the teaching statement as a teaching and learning statement, um, because there is always going to be a connection, should always be a connection between teaching and learning, and that can be articulated through the teaching statement. Um, in a second bullet point, uh, the slide indicates that a teaching statement makes explicit the underlying values that inspire, motivate, inspire and motivate one as a teacher and the overarching goals to achieve or become in and through teaching and learning. Uh, finally, a teaching statement makes explicit the processes or methods through which one and one students embody and enact values and attain goals in the classroom or course. Um, this kind of definition, I think, is an important one because it gives you the sense of the scope of a teaching statement. However, what this kind of definition doesn't really do um, and what the rest of our session will be focusing on is how then to compose, to move forward in the process of creating a statement that actually achieves um, productively and effectively each of these particular elements. I'm gonna be pulling uh, rather liberally uh, today from Keeney et al, the teaching philosophies and teaching dossiers, guide, teaching dossiers guide out of the University of Calgary. Um, that is also a PDF that uh, I think will probably be linked into the chat here now and will be also emailed to you um, after this session so that you can peruse the entirety um, of that teaching philosophies and dossiers guide. Please note that that is from the University of Calgary and in some cases is specific to the University of Calgary and not at Ohio State. But that teaching uh, dossier guideline from Calgary sets out, I think, a very effective approach to thinking about the component parts of a teaching statement. The teaching statement components include, include your beliefs, what, do you, what you think, your strategies for teaching, the, what you do, the impact of your teaching on student learning, what its effect is on learners, yourself, as well as colleagues, and then also your future goals. <clears throat> How will you improve your teaching? So even as you think about future goals, those future goals should look back and reflect on uh, your, your past teaching, your current and past teaching, and then look forward. So it's both retrospective and prospective. So we're going to uh, think about these component parts separately, beliefs, strategies, impact, and future goals. And take each of them here for just a moment and examine each of these. In the guided writing that we're going to ask you to be doing a little bit later, we ask you to begin with um, sort of reflecting on and composing some short statements responses to particular questions where you investigate your beliefs. Even if you're a person who has already passed forth your review, a person who already has an existing P, uh, teaching statement available to you, um, even if you're, just at the, if you're already at the point where you're refining a teaching statement for sixth year review this fall, I really strongly encourage you to step back from those and look into and reflect on your beliefs in your teaching because it's from those core values and principles about your teaching that this process of narrating the entirety of your teaching should begin. So as you reflect on and articulate your values and beliefs, this slide tells us uh, you need or can ask yourself such questions um, as what are my core beliefs about teaching and learning? Why do I hold these beliefs and I would and not others? How and by whom or what have my beliefs been shaped? These could be past experiences, it could be past training, it could be faculty with whom you've worked in the past, other kinds of mentors that you've had external to the university, your own teaching and learning experiences. 
ask yourself what good teaching looks like in your discipline and what it looks like for all students in your classrooms. And finally, ask yourself what expect expectations you hold for learners and again, why? Uh, this is just a set of five questions that we encourage you to consider. There are also others on the worksheets that you received prior to this session. Again, I would, would encourage you to begin with what we're calling worksheet one and exploring these basic beliefs. Oftentimes we hold beliefs implicitly, but stating them explicitly can be um, a, a productive and generative activity. So consider doing that today as we work through this session. Teaching statements also take up strategies, the what you do in the classroom. The strategies actually demonstrate how your values and beliefs translate into practice. So that's the connection. And one of the reasons to begin with beliefs is that we reflect, we want to reflect on, for example, if you use a lot of um, collaborative activities in your classroom, and you know that's a productive evidence-based practice for teaching, it's still really valuable to step back and ask yourself, well, why do I believe that? What does this particular strategy demonstrate about my beliefs? Or what in my beliefs leads me to think about and deploy collaborative activities in my classroom? So we're looking for a linkage across these four domains within teaching statements to seek some alignment from beliefs through strategies and so forth. Identify for yourself how your strategies are also tied forward to the goals for the classes. What do you want students to learn and why? And how do your strategies not only reflect the, previous, the beliefs and values that you hold, but tie forward, if you will, to the goals and objectives for and outcomes for your students in your classrooms, um, your labs and your field, um, the context for teaching. Finally, connect your values and beliefs to key concepts in the literature on teaching and learning. And this is an area where many of us who are not trained um, in colleges of education, who don't have teaching degrees, who haven't specifically had classes in pedagogy and uh, curriculum and instruction, might find a gap in our teaching statements. Connecting our values and beliefs as well as our strategies to the scholarship of teaching and learning, disciplinary-based education research and evidence-based practices is a critical part of a productive and effective teaching statement. For example, how do you actively engage learners? What strategies do you use to do so? How do you think about and align content assessment and learning objectives? That's an element from backward design. How do you design your courses in a way that makes sure that those elements of your teaching and your classroom are connected? And finally, do you and how do you employ relevant high impact practices like um, undergraduate research um, in, in your classrooms? So again, these are questions to consider about strategies. The teaching statement should also take up an impact. And this is one of the areas um, where we find the greatest gaps or absences in teaching statements at the university level. Um, in conversation with Helen, she has noted that if a, if a statement struggles, it is often going to be in a statement of impact in a statement of con in how the work of your classroom impacts students. And a lot of that has to do with the evidence that we use and how we evaluate ourselves as teachers um, in the classroom and how we also assess student learning. We should think about impact, not just in terms of knowledge, but across all of the domains of significant learning. And this is think. Um, and I have a citation here from 2013. I wanna thank Larry Herdebees in the College of Pharmacy who um, reminded me just recently in a session he did last week at New Faculty Orientation about FINK and all of these domains of significant learning. When we think about student impact, we often think about knowledge and application, potentially integration, but FINK's research reminds us that we also need to be thinking about the impact of our teaching on the human dimension of learning, of caring, of metacognition and learning to learn. If these are terms and if the notion of significant learning experiences is, is new to you, I encourage you to uh, look into think, it'll be on our resource sheet, and to think much more broadly about your, the impact of your teaching um, beyond um, 
say, quantitative measures of student learning through assessment in the classroom. Ask yourself as well, not only what difference you have made or hope to make, but also how you will know that you've made that difference for students and had a particular impact. So think about the impact across those domains of learning, but also in terms of what difference you want to make in the academic and lived lives of the students in your classrooms. But then the next step is a critically important one. How will you know that you've achieved that? How can you assess that? To what evidence can you turn to demonstrate how you've had that kind of impact on students? We will have a breakout session where we take up this question. Um, Melinda Rhodes de Salvo will be leading that session. So if you want to really focus in on this today after you've done your writing, we have a session that's for, available for you for that. And then finally, as part of your impact, consider and identify the methods that you'll use to evaluate impact. Um, we often, again, as I said, we think about, we assess students, um, we do maybe formative um, as well as summative assessments in our classrooms. We are much less likely to actually be assessing and evaluating the impact that we're having on students beyond those uh, more typical academic measures of their learning. So please keep these in mind as you think about impact in your teaching statement. And then finally, the teaching statement will include future goals. And it will in take up the question of how you will improve your teaching. As you think about future goals and um, improvement of teaching, I want you to really consider as part of your statement, acknowledging in, in, in their various ways of doing this, various forms of acknowledging the value of continuous growth, continuous growth and improvement in your teaching. Um, we are always lifelong learners, but as teachers, we are lifelong learners of teaching and learning. Um, no one expects a first, second, third, fourth, or even a 25th year teacher to have everything down pat and do it exactly right and do it without error or without flaw. We can always improve in our teaching and having a growth mindset relative to our teaching is critical to that. It's very easy when we see SEI scores at the end of the semester to fixate on those SEI scores and compare them to the 10th of a point to the previous semesters or the semester before that. that. Those are measures that are used at the university as part of your documenting teaching, but they are not the critical point. They are not the most critical point. The difference of a 10th of a point or even two tenths of a point is not um, it is not a clear statement of, nor is it the most relevant part of how you should be assessing and evaluating your teaching and making future goal, making, making your own future goals for your teaching. Articulate a plan to realize continued growth and improvement in your teaching. And among those um, elements might be participating in Drake Institute uh, programming, working with our staff at the Drake Institute, um, in one-on-one -on -one consultations, working with colleagues in your home department or college, um, accessing support from your own teaching and learning center at your college or on your campus. All of these are parts of and demonstrations of your, your interest in and willingness to uh, take a growth mindset and improve your teaching over time. I also encourage you to articular, ask your, articulate your aspirations, those goals that you have for term, uh, your aspirations in terms of SMART goals. And this comes from Doran. Um, SMART goals are those that are specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time bound. To articulate SMART goals for a future, for, a set, for articulating future plans for teaching um, can be actionable. The more specific, the more measurable, attainable, and relevant, the more um, convincing they will be, the more persuasive, the more detailed and focused they will be as part of your teaching statement. So those are the elements of the, the, the teaching statement, future goals being the final of those. Now, when I spoke a little bit earlier, I mentioned that there was, in addition to the 750 word teaching statement, 750 word teaching statement, there's a 250 word evaluation statement that is separate from your teaching statement in your dossier. 
This evaluation statement, um, as this slide tells us, is one that describes how you have used evaluation information to improve the quality of instruction. How you've used evaluation information to improve the quality of instruction. Now, the evaluation information that you typically will have will be SEIs, other discursive evaluations or other evaluation forms from students, as well as peer evaluations or peer observations of your teaching. Those are typically um, the, the data that we have, the evidence that we have to, uh, in an evaluative form as part of our dossiers. So how do you go about and what do you include as you think about and draft toward an evaluation statement? I would suggest interpreting SEIs individually, collectively, and cumulatively over time. Not fixating on those 0.1 or 0.2 differences, but sort of laying them out and looking them at them relative to one another and across time. What sorts of changes do you see? Um, in what areas of the SEI do you flourish? In what other areas um, uh, might you struggle a little bit more? Staff at the Drake Institute and even other faculty in your own department can help you with the work of analyzing those SEIs. I encourage you not to do it alone. I encourage you to have a second or third pair of eyes as you look over that history that's articulated. I would say the same thing for discursive evaluations as well as observations of your teaching. Bring all of these elements together and make them part of how you begin to think about and move from those evaluative data to a narrative that articulates how you're going to improve the quality of your instruction given those data. Um, and again, I would examine and analyze the qualitative, qualitative data and other measures of your teaching, including the peer evaluation and peer observation reports that you might have, <clears throat> excuse me. And as I said, look again for trends in the data and how those change over time. No one is expected to be a perfect teacher at any point in their career. Um, and we all should grow and change as teachers. Um, we all have challenges in our teaching and at different points, we face different kinds of challenges. Acknowledge the challenges that you've faced in your teaching, reflect on those, but also articulate how you're moving forward to address those challenges or have you, how you already have moved forward to address those challenges. And then finally, align the evaluation statement, this 250 word statement with any improvement plan or other elements from your teaching statement. So that alignment, even between the larger, longer teaching statement and this evaluation statement, um, I think is a good connection to make, a good alignment to articulate. Speaking of alignment, the second worksheet that we have available for you that you should already have received and that you could look at and work from today shows you exactly how you can align from beliefs to strategies to impact to future goals. And this slide articulates that across four columns. Um, the beliefs, what are your key beliefs about teaching? Your strategies, how do I or will I put my beliefs into practice? What teaching and learning strategies do I or will I use? On your impact, how do I or will I evaluate the effectiveness and impact of my teaching strategies? If you're in your second or third year, I would say don't worry at this point if you haven't previously thought about impact, you can begin to think about it now. You can begin to think and implement this semester new evaluative processes and strategies for um, identifying and speaking to impact in your teaching. And then finally, how are those three connected to future goals? How do you hope to continue to improve and grow as a teacher? So think about alignment across teaching, learning, research statements, as well as within the teaching statements and evaluation statements themselves. We have, and you have available to you um, and receive through email three separate worksheets and a rubric um, uh, from Kaplan et al. at the University of Michigan. So we're gonna be turning here in just a couple of minutes to a, a guided writing time. I encourage you to begin with worksheet one. I think Laura is also going to put these in the chat if she has not already done it. So if you don't have access to your email, you could just download those uh, um, documents from the chat here today. The worksheet one um, is again from the University of Calgary. 
That's the developing your teaching philosophy statement. And there are several questions on that sheet. I really do encourage you to begin with that one because it begins with beliefs. Um, the second worksheet um, is that alignment that I just showed you on a previous slide, the framework for aligning the philosophy. The third worksheet is a statement of, we're just, it's called, I think, statement of teaching philosophy worksheet. And that is simply a worksheet that articulates the central questions that are pulled from the rubric for statements from Kaplan et al. The rubric for the statements of teaching from Kaplan et al. is kind of the industry standard. It is the one rubric for teaching statements that is most broadly used um, in the United States for preparing graduate students, postdocs, and uh, high, uh, higher education instructors for the creation of teaching statements. So the rubric is there as well. So if you're a rubric based person and would like to look at that and begin there and build back from that into worksheets one, two, and three, um, please feel free to do that. We are not going to be um, monitoring you during the open writing session. Uh, we're going to be breaking here almost exactly on time, a couple of minutes early, for a 30 minute open writing time between 2.40 and 3.10. Um, we will be calling everyone back at 3.10. What I encourage you to do right now is if you have questions based on the uh, presentation that I've just given, put those into the chat. Melinda, Helen, Laura, and I, as we're in this 30 minute break, we'll be convening to look over those questions and we will have ample time, I hope, that later in the session today to answer those questions. So I encourage you now to step away uh, for the next 30 minutes to take up uh, writing, um, composing, answering questions on one of the three worksheets. Um, if you have an existing teaching statement, you could go back to it to look at and maybe, you know, highlight where you talk about principles, values, and beliefs, where you might already take up strategies, um, where you think about future goals or identify impact. There are any number of ways that you can engage right now. But I really, really do strongly encourage you to, to devote yourself to um, in as much as you can in the space that you're in right now, 30 minutes to working on your teaching statement. I'm going to quit sharing my screen here in a moment and we will be back with you at 3.10. Hi everyone, it's 310 and we are back again. Uh, the recording is uh, going live again. Uh, welcome back. I hope that you had a productive uh, time doing a little bit of writing um, on your teaching statement. I'm going to put a couple of quick questions into the chat section. Um, and if you would like to go ahead and answer one or both of these questions, we encourage you to do so. Um, during this session, which question or topic did you explore? Um, and then you can just list the topics that you took up while you were uh, writing. And if you'd like to, please share one new insight or realization about your teaching beliefs, practices, impact, or future goals. And we'll just let that sort of scroll through there on um, the chat session. Um, and you can kind of get a glimpse of what other people were writing and how they focused their time over the last half an hour. I'm gonna wait for just a moment. Um, others may not be back yet. Great, thanks, Amrita. I appreciate that. Um, Helen's also answering a question that came into the chat during our break time or shortly after our break time that Ryan had asked um, about citing literature in the research, or excuse me, citing literature in the teaching statements. Helen, did you want to follow up at all anymore on the response that you gave to Ryan there? 
Yeah, you know, I think the real key is that there's not there there's no one way to write these statements, and so checking in with your own units about you know if, if they have sort of a um, any hard feelings about whether to include them or not include them. But I do think that if you're if you're sort of um, resting your philosophy within the literature, citing that literature is always always worthwhile. Um, and so, you know, I, I think it's not it's not a research paper that you're writing. This is not a scholarly endeavor that you're that you're trying to sort of make an argument. Um, but if you are trying to to really frame your philosophy around what you've read in the literature, then including that is is worthwhile. Um, just just check in with your own units um, because they may they may also have something to say, and it, it might be um, distinct across the different departments. Thanks, Helen. Uh, Melinda, I know there were a couple of other questions that came in during the session. Uh, did you want to maybe speak to those briefly? We have a couple of minutes here before we move into um, the breakout sessions at 320. Sure. Um, I think one of the questions had to do with um, teaching statements and their relationships to teaching philosophies. Um, really, it's, it's how much are they similar and how are they different? And, and I would invite Helen actually to, to um, chime in on this particular question. But I think, Kay, some of your slides did address this. Um, the teaching philosophy that we have often focuses on values and beliefs. Um, and when we think about teaching statements, we're making that connection between the values and beliefs and the practices themselves vis-a-vis -vis the strategies that we know that exist in literature. Often we're also considering how we're engaging in assessment of student learning outcomes in our own courses and with various assignments. So um, Helen, did you want to add to that? Uh, I, I think the only thing I might add would be to say that, um, you know, just to re-highlight something Kay said earlier, which is that as you're preparing these materials for annual review or promotion and tenure or promotion, that um, the, the impact your teaching is having is really that step beyond your philosophy around teaching. It's really about, you know, the, uh, it might contain some information about your philosophy, but it it's really might go something like, you know, this, oh my gosh, my children, I'm sorry. <laughs> this, this is my philosophy around teaching. These are the strategies I employ. And then this is what's become of those things as, as they've come together. Uh, and, and I think as I read through these statements, that's the thing I look for. Um, and it, it really is about who you are as an instructor, a teacher, a mentor here at Ohio State and how you're impacting those people that you've been working with. And Katie, the other question that we had uh, was related to scholarship of teaching and learning. And I, I do think that there'll be a breakout room conversation around that with Helen. So please do go into her breakout room if you have some interest in that. Um, just to point out that often the beginnings of scholarship of teaching and learning um, reside with assessment of student learning outcomes. So we start to really look at how we're assessing whether or not our students are mastering the learning outcomes we've crafted for the course or for modules. So it can be on a number of different levels. And then all of a sudden we have a question that we want to explore to a greater degree. So I think there were some questions that were leaning in that direction and some questions that were leaning in the direction of what are the requirements. Uh, and there's no requirement to do so, but um, please do visit Helen in her breakout room. Great, thank you. Um, I was just following through here. Thanks to those of you who have posted in the chat uh, what it is you were investigating and what some of your sort of realizations were, what you kind of uncovered through the process. Um, I do encourage you to continue working through those. I did want to note here again, before we move into the breakout rooms in a couple of minutes that we will be following this session up with additional guided writing sessions, um, sessions with Drake Institute staff, with Melinda and me. Um, among those sessions, we will have um, available sample successful teaching statements from Ohio State faculty. Um, we'll also do some of those activities, one of which I mentioned a little bit earlier, which is let's look at our current teaching statements and 
you know, highlight them and investigate how much time we spend on beliefs, how much time we spend on strategies, where we're talking about impact. So even if you have existing statements that you're simply revising for fourth year review or your tenure um, meeting, um, you'll, you can work from an existing statement to kind of run it through this process of investigating where you're focusing and where you might focus differently in your teaching statement. As Helen said, there's no one model. There's no one way of doing this. Um, they do vary from discipline to discipline. Um, but, and so there's no magic formula of 20% takes up this question and 25 takes up another. But there was a question that came to me privately through the chat asking about that balance and especially about um, achievements. And I do want to note that on those 10 items in documenting teaching, there is a space for you to note the achievements of your students. So of your graduate and undergraduate students. So if you list those in the other spaces in your teaching, uh, your documenting teaching, you needn't list those as part of your teaching statement. Um, you could refer back to them as evidence of impact uh, for example, a number of students in one of the undergraduate classes I taught a few years ago all successfully published their work from my class. That's an achievement. I listed it under uh, in my documenting teaching list of my students' achievements and simply referred to it in the teaching statement as a piece of evidence of impact. Um, so once we get into the details of each of our teaching portfolios and the work that we do within our disciplines, we begin to see these nuances um, and the statement itself should accommodate those nuances, right? So you shouldn't be so attached to a particular expectation of genre or a model or a sample you've seen from someone else. This is a dynamic space and it needs to be and conform to your portfolio of teaching um, and mentoring as Helen mentioned. Well, I, th I think everyone is either back or making their way back um, into this main session. Um, I wanted to, I, I noted that we'll have, do have an opportunity here for just a few more minutes of conversation or uh, finishing uh, up, you know, conversations that were underway or questions that you all may have. Um, I wanted to turn it over to Helen first to see uh, whether there were uh, matters, items that you might wanted to share out with everyone here or any kind of uh, wrap up that you might have. We did want to point out that um, and suggest to people that if they didn't attend your session last Friday on the, the PT workshop that you did, that we would encourage them to view that video. I believe Laura has the link to that and we'll put it in chat. But um, I think that Zoom video either is or will be up on the new faculty site um, here shortly. Is that right, Helen? It will be, I unless uh, I checked earlier today uh, and it wasn't there yet, but the plan is for it to be up there um, shortly. Um, thanks for the opportunity. I, I think I wanna, uh, I know we have some um, guests with us today who are um, not candidates. They're on the administrative side of the, the work and um, in viewing, if you missed Friday's session and you wanna look at it, it's very similar to the sessions that we run uh, for uh, PNT committee chairs, committees of eligible faculty, um, chairs of departments, associate deans, deans. Um, but it did. It, we did take a faculty-focused look. So um, we really looked at at the the entire process, but from the faculty's perspective rather than the administrator's perspective. So um, you know, just bear that in mind if you go look at that video. Also, we do we do have sessions. <laughs> in uh, April, August, and October uh, for our administrators in this process to, to have some workshop time. Um, the, the couple of comments that came up in this session um, and a couple of the questions, I just wanna highlight a couple of things that we are an incredibly diverse university in terms of um, what we teach, how we teach, who we teach, um, when we teach, uh, our approaches to teaching, our beliefs about teaching, um, that even the content that we teach. And so this session is really designed to help you think about how you're going to construct your own teaching statement within the context of the space that you work. Um, and so um, engaging with your um, faculty and your departments and your units 
talking through some of the content kinds of questions is so important because you can come to someone like me or someone like Kay uh, or someone like Melinda and say, hey, could you give me some feedback on this statement? And absolutely, we're, we are all skilled and, and well enough read to be able to do that. But the kinds of feedback that we might give you will be very high level, right? It's the 10,000 foot view of does this read well? Does, is it logical? Within your own units, they, they, there's the history and the culture of your units. And they may say, oh, you really need to highlight X or Y a little bit differently because our criteria in our department say X or Y, and you wanna make sure that you highlight that. So be sure that you contact your local um, groups to, to engage with them and get some feedback on your work because it, it is going to be um, different across the university what's expected. Um, the two big things that came out of our session were, um, um, okay, I think you said this already, um, please don't quote students. Um, really, we're looking for the overarching impact you've had on students, not one particular student. Um, and I think I, I sort of said this already, but someone had raised in the question whether or not, um, you know, as we move into, particularly in arts and sciences, recently uh, approved the teaching um, faculty title uh, for the entire college. And I know departments are right now going through the process of determining whether or not they're going to have teaching faculty. Um, so within that um, faculty role, um, the question comes up, well, how do, you, how do you measure teaching? How do you measure research? How do you measure service? And I'm going to say the same thing I said on Friday, which is that the criteria are set forth by your TIU. And so, um, you know, make sure you're looking at that PNT APT document for your unit. Um, there's not going to be people in those roles yet, uh, unless um, that title was already in existence within the unit. So just um, pay attention to the criteria. There was another question about senior lecturers and research. That's really going to rely on your um, role whether you're expected to do research or whether you're expected to do all teaching or whether, you know, what your, um, what the expectations are. So there's no mandated, you know, you must do X at the university because there's so much difference in how, in, in the kinds of work that we do, but make sure you talk about that locally to get those answers to your questions. So I think that would be my, my wrap up. Oh, uh, sorry, Kay, one more, <laughs> one more really quick thing. Everything that we talked about today in terms of thinking and structuring and building your statements uh, applies across all of your statements. So you have the other statements and Kay mentioned this, that there's not a, I wouldn't, I would not argue that there's a different strategy that you would take when you pick up your research statement or when you pick up your, your service statement, right? You really wanna think about those key pieces, in particular, your impact, in those areas. Um, and so there's not, you'll, you'll probably go look from like, where's the research statement session? Where's the service session? We don't, we don't have those. Um, and in large part, it's because the process is really parallel across those spaces, but the content and what you include in those statements is, is gonna vary, but use the structure that we talked about here today, and particularly the, the sort of foundational skeleton that Kay gave you at the beginning, is a really good place for starting and thinking about your research and service statements. So I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Kay. Thanks, Helen. So I'm gonna to turn to Melinda here in just a moment to um, give us a little um, like summary back or continue conversation from the breakout session. Melinda, I'm also gonna put up the next step slide so you could move from that directly into your recommendations for, for next steps. So I'm gonna share my screen here in just a moment and we will continue taking questions in the chat um, if you do have questions here in the next 10 or 15 minutes or so. So let me go ahead and... Uh, this slide. There you go. Okay, Melinda, thanks. Great, thank you. Um, well, one of the questions that came up, or at least some of the discussion and conversation that arose during our um, breakout session had to do with um, early term 
course feedback. And that's one of the next steps that we would highly recommend for all instructors. In fact, it doesn't matter where you are in your career track, uh, early term course feedback is really one of those valuable practices that uh, indicates to your students your concern about their learning experience, your willingness to hear what they have to say about the learning experience in, in your course, and um, your, um, I think, dedication to their success as students. So uh, early term course feedback really does take place weeks three to five, somewhere in there very, very early on in the course. And um, when we when we think about early term feedback, we want to think about um, enabling ourselves to make meaningful changes quickly, you know, and efficiently, or promoting student engagement, um, hearing students' questions, and seeking out points of confusion for them. Um, and it, it surprisingly or not, it does have the potential for improving your SEIs at the end of the course. Uh, in fact, a 2011 study uh, indicated that if you do early term feedback, share the results with students and make a change, it can be up to a 9%. Uh, it, this was a particular institution um, increase. So that, that uh, is something that I think we're all interested in. But more importantly, I think we're interested in what our students have to say about how we can affect their student learning. So with early term feedback, it's just really asking three questions. And you can, you can also adjust these questions to be more specific if you've made some changes in a course or you're trying something new in a course. But it's basically what features of this course contribute most to your learning? Uh, what changes can the instructor make? to support or enhance your learning and um, what can you do to improve your learning, which is also a way of asking our students to reflect a little bit on their role and their partnership with us in this learning endeavor. So uh, certainly that's, that's something that we would encourage. Um, if you have additional information or if you want additional information on early term feedback, feel free to email the Drake Institute or email me and I'd be happy to provide that. Thanks, Melinda. And, and you can see here we have several, I think there are about 10 different next possible steps for each of you. Um, I would recommend the Angelo and Cross Teaching Goals Inventory. This is a really um, interesting uh, inventory, very easy to take. You just step into it, identify a single course that you're teaching, and then just work your way through a series of prompts that ask you the degree to which um, you in that course you do or do not um, sort of uh, work to achieve or reach have students reach particular goals. I did it for a class that I teach regularly an undergraduate course in the English department and it really revealed for me just as an example how much I focus in on and reasonably for this course critical reading critical writing and analysis but I saw this real gap in um, speaking to um, the students' lived lives, sort of the affective part of my teaching. So as I look at that and complete that inventory, it encouraged me to step back and reflect on my own practices, even in that course, which I've taught for many, many years, and I feel like I've taught it successfully. Um, and it encouraged for me reflection and then change. Um, I, we would also encourage completing the teaching practices inventory, which is a separate inventory, um, stepping into and completing teaching at Ohio State, which I think you are all are enrolled in. And if you're not, Melinda and Laura can get you enrolled in that course. It's a five module online course, a kind of introduction to teaching at Ohio State, but it does focus on, um, we have additional resources on teaching online and uh, inclusive teaching practices. Uh, so we encourage you to do that if you have not already. To schedule as well a one-on-one -on -one consultation with our Drake Institute consultants. Um, there are uh, professionals in the areas of teaching and learning and instructional support uh, and can work with you on teaching statements, um, early team, early teach, early term feedback, um, as well as scheduling a SCID, a small group instructional diagnosis. Although this semester right now, those are limited to uh, small face-to-face um, -face or small enrollment courses um, online. We would also encourage you to just informally visit others' classrooms and invite others into your classroom. Um, trusted close peers uh, who can give you feedback, you know, potentially on particular areas of your teaching. Um, access our resources on teaching statements on the Drake Institute website. 
And then if you are a new first year faculty member, we encourage you to consider joining our, one of our FIT mentoring cohorts or book circles. Um, and then finally, for all of you to select and complete a Drake Institute teaching endorsement. And you can find information on all of these resources on the Drake website. Um, with that, um, I wanna just turn to um, some thank yous. Uh, again, to Laura, uh, Helen, and Melinda for joining us, facilitating and supporting us at this session. Um, I'm going to turn now to a last slide uh, with our contact information and just leave it there for a few moments uh, so that you can note that information if you would like to have it. Um, and then I'll turn off my slide share and come back to see if there are any other final questions. Um, that you all might have. Uh, I think Melinda and I are able to stick around uh, maybe for just a couple of minutes if you do have questions and we exceed our four o'clock time. But with that, I will stop my share and see if there were any other questions. Hey, yes. this is Corey again, <laughs> sorry. Um, so Scott Zimmerman posted a question and I think Melinda, um, said that it would be a good question for Helen about which I'm also interested in uh, knowing is for the between the fourth year and the sixth year review narratives if we can just tweak those to kind of update those narratives or do we have to write something completely new. Hi Carrie thanks thanks for bringing that up we had talked about that in our room and I and it, I just didn't didn't remember to raise it here, please don't rewrite your statement once you have it written. Once you write it, um, I think someone early, early, early in the chat said, you know, I have one now and it's probably not great. Um, but that's the first one you write is probably not going to be great. But once you have the bones that you're happy with, then what you're going to adjust is you're just going to adjust the, you know, the structure, some of the content, you'll update it. But unless you have a a pretty significant pivot in the kind of teaching that you're doing, the kind of focus that you have. Um, I would say, you know, something I thought of after after I answered Scott's question is there is the potential, you know, that um, we will make adjustments in the Office of Academic Affairs to say we're missing a component of teaching evaluation that needs to be included. If those happen, then you'll need to update your statement but you very, it would be unlikely that you would sort of toss the whole thing and start from scratch. It would be a, it would be a pretty significant revision to, to add new content. But um, between the fourth year and the sixth year review, they're probably gonna be relatively minor changes unless your committee comes back to you at the fourth year and says, um, so you might've missed the mark and we're gonna give you some re recommendations to make improvements and make adjustments and, and really beef up this statement. They might also come back and say, this is really great. We have really minor edits, but there's no expectation anywhere that you have to recreate these statements at every uh, point in time where you're being reviewed. Please don't do that. Not a good use of your time, not, not a good use of anybody's time. So unless there are situations where you've been asked to rewrite it, you've been asked to add new material, use what you have and just keep updating it. And, you know, as Kay suggested with, new things that come along uh, in your work. Okay, thank you so much. And I'm sorry, I must have missed it when no. you just got before. No, that's okay. I was, I was actually, no, that's good. I was actually curious to see if Helen had a, the same or a very similar answer to mine. And you all can see because I reposted my, that she did. Um, because my perspective from this is only as a professor in the English department. Um, I don't have that broader view because I've sent, spent my entire career here at the English department at Ohio State. So thanks, Helen. Glad to know that I wasn't far off the mark with that. Um, Carrie, thank you again for that question. Scott, for the question. I want to thank all of you for joining us. Um, again, we will have this recording available. We make sure to just send the link out to you so you'll have access to it. We'll also be sending out to you announcements and registration for our upcoming sessions on more uh, focused guided writing sessions, um, as well as looking at and evaluating, analyzing successful teaching statements. We'll have a few of those coming up in the next couple of months this spring. See you all, and again, thanks for coming in. Thanks everybody. Melinda, do you have a minute to stick around if somebody has some questions? Okay, great. 
All right, I have to pop off, guys. Okay, Good thanks, you. Helen. Bye, Helen. <clears throat> thanks hey, for letting Mark. me join yeah. you all oh yeah. gosh you're welcome i was just gonna say all colleagues and friends oh. here that i yes I'm look at this <laughs> and uh laura i tweeted about you today did Laura you? Struve? Yes, I did. Yeah. Oh, yeah. so I'm I'm Rita. Uh, and Laura. <laughs> I was just going to say for um. Oh, there I was going to say for um Rita and could see uh, uh, Laura Struve is one of our new staff in the Drake Institute. So Laura, give them a shout out and a wave. Yeah. Could see you're uh, is at Newark, right? No. Yes. No. no Marion. And um Rita is at yes. Newark. So yes. Hi, Kay. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Hi. Yes. I'm at Marion. Good to see yeah. You. It was so yes, good. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Thank Thanks you so much. Good awesome. to see you all. And it was really helpful. And I had the same question at, as Carrie did about four, fourth and sixth year review. So it was nice to hear into the response that Helen and you all had. So, Great. yeah, I'm in the same boat. And I had a good feedback from my fourth year review but you know like in my department so I'm from College of Engineering and we don't really get a you know a final response or any answer from the department we just get a letter for promotion so I mean on fourth you know, year they said it's the, the contract mm -hmm. is extended so yeah yep. I mean <laughs> how That's do we get a feedback specific feedback about uh what they think about our dossier that's that's more important for me because it seems like you know, our supervisors do look at it, but then it's, they don't provide any feedback. Yes, it's good or no, it's not good. So. Well, I would, I would comment. encourage a couple of things because you're on the regional mm -hmm. campus, right? Your yes. assessment is sort of falls into two parts, right? So you uh -huh. have the campus assessment and yes. the Columbus campus department yes. assessment. Mm -hmm. As it turns out, Laura Cotton was previously in the College of Engineering and the staff mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. um, Laura, I was going to recommend to Kutsia that she maybe reached out to the P and T chair on the in the on the Columbus campus. Yeah, you could do that. It's interesting right? because I know those dossiers are reviewed, mm -hmm. and and they do. I mean, it might be a case of no news is good news, really, because if they have problems, I know they they address those. I see. Um, okay. I would. Yeah, I. You could try the. But the committee, the, the promotion and tenure committee doesn't review the fourth year review dossiers in engineering. Uh -huh. um, oh. the I think only the department reviews it and my Rachel Cleet reviews. reviews. Rachel, oh, I was going to say, okay, it. that's, well, I was, that's why I was recommending maybe going to the P&T chair in the department on the Columbus. Yeah, mm -hmm. in the, in the, maybe in the, your department P&T chair, or I would go to them first. I would kind of follow the chain, but you probably could email Rachel and she would probably respond to you or would respond sure. to you. I shouldn't say probably. Sure, she sure. It might take a minute, but mm -hmm. she, she actually personally reviews those. Oh, and really? then okay. Patty Christenberry, who is one of her assistants, reviews mm -hmm. them for like if the written pieces are like way too long and things like that or, and, yeah. and, and process yeah. procedure. Mm -hmm. But Rachel mm -hmm. actually reads them. So if she had input, you know, she would be willing to share it with you. I, I thought she did, but they may just write a letter for the fourth mm -hmm. year reviews unless there's a real problem. So I, I, I would go that route. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah. I had that question for Kay in the beginning, <laughs> whether my <laughs> statements were too long or too short, how much do we elaborate? So if I get, uh, you know, feedback about, oh, this was too long, you can, you can shorten it or maybe more you know, you don't have to elaborate that much, then maybe I would, you know, consider that. But mm -hmm. I didn't get any feedback. So I was hoping that everything is going well. <laughs> I, I think that I was just gonna say, I think that would be my, um, mm -hmm. my <laughs> inclination would be to think it's fine. Mm -hmm. um, if there were an issue, I think you, they would they would know it, they, because mm -hmm. as you move into sixth review, if you think about it, a department is making the department's made, if you will, an investment in you and they want to mm -hmm. invest. They're investing in mm -hmm. your success. Mm -hmm. So if there are issues that have come up that they think could complicate or compromise the sixth year review, mm -hmm. they're going to let you know. Okay. Um, they're not going to let something um, just continue if it potentially could be um, mm -hmm. a challenge for you later on. 
Sure. I mean, relative to the statements themselves, but we are on our staff. We have folks who are happy to give that as I don't remember if Helen said 50,000 foot or 50,000 <laughs> foot view or whatever to yeah. act on, on the nature of the statement overall, right? Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And the balance across, um, but always we would also encourage also for you, if you have a trusted recently tenured colleague in your department or mm -hmm, um, on mm -hmm. your campus to whom you mm -hmm. could you know share with whom you could share the statement sure. um okay. i would encourage that as well but we're all okay. also happy to look at them laura struvi in particular comes with a lot of of uh of background and expertise in teaching statements mm -hmm. she's new to the state, but not not new to this work mm -hmm. i yeah that's how you know i nerd nerd out is i love reviewing teaching teaching <laughs> statements so <laughs> this is very good to know you might, you might hear from me i will, well, I will be, be great. in touch great. with you <laughs> Great. And are you, are, are you, you're Struvi.5, is that right? Four. Mm -hmm. Four. Okay. Four. Four. Yeah. Struvi.4, okay. S-T-R-U-V-E.4. Mm -hmm. So there's your contact. Yeah. Could see it. Yes. <laughs> All right. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for that joining helps. us. Thank you so much. This was really helpful. Yeah, Bye. Bye. Have a Bye -bye. good rest of your day. Bye-bye.